Egoism Selfishness over solidarity, power without morals. That's what I'll be discussing today with Herfried Munkler, one of Germany's best-known political scientists. Welcome to the program. Good to have you with us, too, for the DW interview. My name is Thomas Spahn. Mr. Munkler, you wrote a dissertation on Niccolo Machiavelli and a lexicon on the Renaissance. How did that come about? Do you just love Italy? Um. Well, I certainly got to know Italy better through my dissertation, and I came to love it too. I really appreciated the somewhat different way of life, and Niccolo Machiavelli's sharp mind, the way he thought, was very challenging to me, but at the same time a pleasant companion to my own thinking. And the different way of life? It starts with a climate. It's not advisable to work through the middle of the day, at least not in summer. So you develop a certain ease, a more relaxed attitude to time. Unless you have an air-conditioned workspace, that's the modern Italy as opposed to the traditional Italy. You wrote the Renaissance lexicon that I mentioned together with your wife. Living and working together can sometimes be challenging. Was it more fun than work in your case? It was certainly challenging, and there are many such projects where marriage has not survived that kind of collaboration. My wife is a literary and cultural scholar in the wider sense. But I don't think readers would be able to tell which of us wrote which chapters. If you tried to guess going by our professions, you'd come up with the wrong answer. Returning to Machiavelli, his theory of divide and rule and the idea that the end justifies the means appears to be very much in evidence right now when we look at Russia and Turkey. Would you say that's the case? That's an oversimplification. That's based to a certain extent on the presumption that Machiavelli was Machiavellian. That's probably as simplistic as the idea that Marx was a Marxist. Marx said expressly, I am not a Marxist. We don't have a statement like that from Machiavelli, but then while he was alive there was no established line of thinking known as Machiavellianism. Certainly one of Machiavelli's central ideas was that one should focus on the underlying interests involved and on geographical constellations, and not so much on the romanticism of talk about values. He never put it that way, but that was basically what he was saying. And the reason is because behind all the talk about values, there are always interests at stake. And those who want to know how things will turn out in a serious situation, and how those involved will decide, should look more at the situation and the interests involved, and less at what values are being espoused. That's what I'm referring to that Western values, in particular human rights, play a secondary role both in Putin's Russia and Erdogan's Turkey. And when it comes to the refugee issue, Europe is especially dependent on both of these countries. So how is it that Europe is now at the mercy of others? I'd say the divide in values goes right through Europe. The Visegrad states, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland and Slovakia, have somewhat different ideas. Those universal values are subject to national interests and national value systems. Whereas in Germany, or let's be generous and say in the Western and Northern EU states, Perhaps the opposite is true. That has nothing to do with core values, but more because those countries are much more integrated into the global framework, so that universalism and globality tend to meet and complement each other. When you talk about Turkey and Russia, they're influenced by geographical constellations which have come into play because the international community has waited too long on the Syria question, 
not to put too fine a point on it. There were reasons to wait. We don't know who's our ally. We don't know what our goal would be if we intervened. But this waiting has caused these two former empires, Russia, which once ruled as Tsarist Russia and also as the Soviet Union, and Turkey with its Ottoman Empire, to develop something akin to neo-imperial dreams. Angela Merkel nationalized the refugee crisis by opening Germany's borders for migrants. Now she wants to Europeanize the crisis. Was that a mistake? I don't think you can describe it like that. Opening the borders back then in late August, early September was basically a step that made the territory of Germany available as an overflow for a problem that had built up in the Balkans. If you imagine what would have happened if Germany hadn't taken in the refugees, who had broken out in Hungary and ran onto the motorway with the resulting repercussions, you could have probably written off the entire stabilization strategy for the Balkans. When the crisis arose in Hungary, shouldn't Angela Merkel have gone to Brussels and discussed this problem in European terms and put pressure on the other Europeans instead of bringing the refugees to Germany? In hindsight, you might come to the conclusion that that would have been the better step in tactical terms. But the question is, how long would it have taken for this step to be successful? The problem at the time was to act under time pressure. Acting under time pressure is the nature of politics. So yes, it would have been wiser to keep the Hungarians hanging for a while. Actually, all of the Visegrad group who are now causing this stress, in the hope that some refugees would eventually go to Poland and bring about a solution that way. You could say that, at the time, Germany's politicians were too hasty and too mindful that no damage be done to Europe. Knowing what we know now, you could say they should have demonstrated more calm and composure. They could have played for time and, so to speak, only helped when the others were just short of drowning. But you really can't blame Angela Merkel now for not having done that. In Germany, every refugee has the right to have their case decided in the courts. Do you think Germany's asylum law might have to be reformed or even scrapped to end this crisis? Germany basically has two options. Either create a proper immigration law and immigration policy and thereby relieve the pressure on the individualized asylum system and leave that for the kind of scenario for which it was originally intended or continue to further restrict and modify the asylum law. That would probably not be a good development. Then the only guidelines would be the terms of the Refugee Convention of 1951. Mm. Germany's asylum law is almost a sacred institution, especially for left-leaning people. You were once a young socialist yourself. I'll bet you would have sharply criticized any changes. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I was also involved in local politics. That means I was in the fortunate position of being able to observe the consequences of my political actions relatively quickly. Of course, there are differing perceptions here. Those who are relatively close to the problem, who are worried about the logistics of how to house everyone, like the mayors and the district administrators, they will have a different perspective than those who worry about preserving social democratic tradition or the tradition of liberalism or whatever. With all the talk about Greece, the special status for Britain and the refugee crisis, will the EU survive 2016? 
I can imagine it surviving, but not in its current form. If it does survive, then only because it's entered into a process of transformation. You've been called a one-man think tank with a wealth of knowledge as a political scientist. Have you never been tempted to go into politics yourself, to change things? You have hinted at that. I was involved in politics at the local level until 1985. I enjoyed it, and at the time I withdrew from it because of the birth of our daughter, I'd basically been doing it for 12 years. That's quite a lot for a political scientist. So I know the area I'm researching fairly well. Besides, research is incredibly sweet. You can scarcely imagine. What knowledge do you hope to pass on to your children? Mm. Sober reflection, toughness and a good work ethic. And also a basic sense of optimism that boils down to there are always decisions and courses of action you can take. You must find them and never sink into melancholy. Which brings us to the point in the interview where we ask you to finish three sentences for us. Europe is in a desperate state, but I still hope... That it finds the strength to return to orderly policies and structures. I've written many books and I'm often on TV. The jealousy of some of my colleagues is annoying. If I'd lived in the Renaissance, I would have liked to be someone like Niccolò Machiavelli. Herr Fried Münkler, thank you. Gladly.